Artist Susanna Berner will discuss the architects Baudin Lachère and Josef Janatschka, who designed the 1929 Warsaw residence that is the site of her film, A House of One's Own, Me and My Neighbors. And finally, architect and professor at the Bauhaus University in Weimar, Verena von Beckerath, will discuss the Two Houses Research Project, which looks at the relationship between the Bauhaus and Japan through two houses in Tokyo, the Nagishi Atelier and the Bunzo Yamaguchi House. This is a project uh, von Beckerath conducted with a team, and you'll find the full bios in the um, program notes. The products, the products of this research, a book and a film, you've had a chance to see. So after these presentations, we'll have a conversation and this is very much open to the audience. So we encourage you to um, participate and type your questions in the Q and A. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to um, Sus Susan Morgan and here we go. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. um, thank you, Kate. And um, thank you um, for including this. Uh, this is the writer Esther McCoy. Um, it's, you can't see her quite uh, so well there, um, who was born in 1904, uh, died in 1989. Uh, she's really best known as the person, could I have the next image? Um, she's best known as the person who put West Coast modernism on the map. Um, in 1960, she published um, her book, Five California Architects, which focused on the, um, the work of R.M. Schindler, Irving Gill, whose Dodge House film is, Dodge House is the subject of her film, uh, Bernard Maybeck and the Green Brothers. Uh, when the book came out, um, Esther McCoy remarked that it was sort of a cult book and it was popular with young architects. It wasn't really viewed as architectural history. Uh, and as she said that architectural history was usually about public buildings and written about the facade. And this focused more on domestic architecture and also really uh, on architecture as a social art. And McCoy, who was a literary writer who found uh, a subject in architecture, really understood that, that design comes out of people's lives. And with the book, um, she said that she felt that she um, understood, uh, having worked as a draftsman for R.M. Schindler, uh, that she had worked um, on drawings and she understood blueprints and that she thought that's where her point of view came back, who came from. Whereas I think she's really a literary writer. And so she really understood that the floor plan is the plot and how people move through life. So could I have the next image? Um, Esther McCoy began um, writing about architecture in the 1940s, but in the 1930s, she was already publishing. And this is a sort of odd picture to include, but it's her friend, Jean Evans. And in 1936, uh, Jean Evans, who's also a writer, also involved with leftist politics, as was Esther McCoy, um, married a writer, um, married a young director named Nicholas Ray. And Nicholas Ray and Esther McCoy worked on a screenplay together that was about um, a sensitive, misguided youth, and it was never produced. Um, I guess what I want to get at here is the fact, the question is, why would, um, why would a writer make a film? And really how Esther McCoy, not only having been born um, in 1904 and having grown up with film, um, 
and with the, her campaign to save the Dodge House, making a film uh, to reach a wider audience. That as early as 1936, she was collaborating um, on screenplays. And she also in the 1930s had co-authored uh, three, uh, three mystery novels. Um, she had written a short novel that had won a prize but failed to find a publisher. And as she said, 1931 was not a good year to place a small book about a girl dying from an abortion. Um, so she was unable to sell that. Um, so in the, um, the 1940s, we had the next slide, the next blurry image, the small blurry image. In the 1940s, Esther McCoy uh, went to work as a draftsman for R.M. Schindler. And this very small poor image, you can see up here, um, the Schindler House, and this is a photograph by Esther McCoy. And this appeared in um, Gebhard and Winter's uh, Guide to Architecture in Southern California. And in their, the book is dedicated to Esther McCoy. And as they point out, uh, we owe our understanding of, of California modernism to her one woman crusade. So if you can go to the next image. So Esther McCoy um, uh, began in the mid, as I said, in the mid 1940s, really writing about architecture. And she's here, she's in the middle, kind of art directing a photo shoot for a magazine called Living for Young Homemakers. And in this photo shoot, she worked with um, two photographers and one of them uh, was Irvin Jordan. And could I have the next one? Irvin Jordan, um, went on to uh, start a company in the mid 1940s called Photo Films. And with that company, he, it was a subscription series and they were 16 millimeter films uh, that the subscribers who were schools and universities and organizations um, would receive these 16 millimeter films. Um, for public events. And so Esther McCoy, who you see here um, with a photographer, Ouija, um, wrote, collaborated with Irvin Jordan and wrote a number of these films. And one was about Ouija, another was about the photographer, Edward Weston, and then the next image. Um, and this is R.M. Schindler. Um, another film that they made was in 1950, was called Architecture West. And it was a hundred years of West Coast architecture, beginning with um, the Pacific Northwest and uh, the blockhouse at Yam Hill. And then in the, final, uh, in the final frames, you see the construction of the Eames house. And as far as I know, this is the only film I've ever found uh, that actually features uh, R.M. Schindler. Um, Esther McCoy and Irvin Jordan also um, tried to make a similar film. Uh, they were unable to raise funds for it, but to make a film about modern architecture in Mexico. So the next, um, so also in 1950, um, Esther McCoy's uh, short story, The Cape, which had originally appeared in Harper's Bazaar magazine, and again, is a, a modern story. It's about a divorced uh, woman being treated for breast cancer by a misogynist doctor. And so her story was included in the best American short stories. And a number of writers from the West Coast, from Los Angeles in particular, uh, created a writing group of uh, short story writers uh, and met for the next over throughout the 1950s and 60s. And so Esther McCoy was part of that group. And so she continued um, while she was writing about architecture to also write and publish short stories. She also wrote radio plays um, and screenplays. And so in the members, the next image, um, and these are some of the members of the group um, included in the group uh, was Ray Bradbury, and then the next one. Um, and this is the writer Sonora Babb and her husband, James Wong Howe, um, who is the great cinematographer. 
and the next one, um, and this is uh, hard to see, but it's it's Jimmy Howe. James Wong Howe was born in China, grew up um, in Washington State in Oregon, and as a teenager, uh, he was a, a boxer, a featherweight boxer, and had some success as a boxer. And uh, with Esther McCoy. Uh, he gave her the idea, a story idea, and she wrote a screenplay um, about a boxer in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, based on James Wong Howe's idea. So the next image. Esther McCoy also collaborated um, with the screenwriter, uh, Sylvia Richards, who's best known for um, writing these kind of Freudian film noirs that were directed by Fritz Lang. And in the 1950s, um, McCoy uh, revived the screenplay that she had started with Nicholas Ray um, and completed it with, with Sylvia Richards. And also in the 1950s, the studio, um, the studio, a studio had bought the rights to a sociology book that was called Rebel Without a Cause. And at that point, um, Nicholas Ray had established himself as a film director and was brought in on this project. And although they had this great title, they had no script. And so the studio cast around um, for different screenwriters and reviewed um, different art, already completed screenplays, including the one that was written by Sylvia Richards and Esther McCoy. And although that they didn't become the screenwriters um, for the movie that did become Rebel Without a Cause, uh, two major locations in their script appear in the movie. And one is the abandoned mansion and the other um, is the Griffith Observatory, the scene in the planetarium. So um, could I have the next? Side. So all of this, um, you know, kind of hurried introduction is uh, to say that Esther McCoy making this, it's not really an anomaly that she created a film. Um, she had worked in film, she had written numerous screenplays, and so the idea of using film um, as part of her campaign um, for the Dodge House uh, really comes out of out of her work and very much. And this is in 1970, her campaign is, I think has been made clear, failed. And the Dodge House was demolished um, unannounced. And here you see it. Um, and in the Esther McCoy papers, there's a note from a neighbor um, which says, I went out in the morning and when I came back out, when I came back two hours later, the wrecking crew was there. They beat it and beat it and it wouldn't go down. It was like an animal being beaten. They kept beating and beating and it finally cracked up. The trees didn't want to go either, but they beat them until by late afternoon, everything was gone. Uh, the woman who wrote the, um, this note was named Cecilia Reef and she also lived on King's Road and I meant to point out earlier that King's Road as a subject and King's Road really as a point of view for Esther McCoy is very significant. Um, not only did she work uh, for Schindler um, at 833 King's Road, the Dodge House um, was at 950 King's Road. Uh, she also worked and had worked in New York uh, for the novelist Theodore Dreiser who lived at 1015 North Kings Road. So all of this framework is, you know, she has an intimate knowledge of this place and also this understanding um, really of the, the vision of modernism and the psychological um, impact of, of domestic architecture. And so the final image is this. Um, this is the house that Cecilia and Harry Reef lived in, which was um, at 906 North Kings Road. Um, it was designed by Aaron Green, who was a student 
of Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, was an uh, Talies and Fellow. And this house was built in um, uh, 1951. And in 1970, uh, the house, 1971 rather, uh, the house was destroyed in a suspicious fire. And so in the story of King's Road, I don't know that um, a writer, even a writer who was as good at figuring out plot and character as Esther McCoy really could have figured out this particular outcome. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Now, Susanna Berner. Hello. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you, Kate, for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to present, we have presented the film and um, to talk uh, about it. So I will um, start my presentation. So as you know, probably the film A House of One's Own, Me and My Neighbors, is about a systemic constellation that took place in a um, house in Warsaw. And the systemic constellation was there to uh, kind of explore the relationship um, of the house uh, with the neighboring houses. So it was um, an attempt to um, um, understand, like to use an alternative method to understand um, the, the, the network in that particular neighborhood. So first it's about uh, me, that is in, in the title. Um, who is me? Who, uh, me is um, a house on Ulitsa Katowicka, 9 to 11A, in Saska Kempa in Warsaw. It had been constructed by Budan Lachert and Josef Schneitzer in um, 1928, um, beginning 1928 and um, was finished in um, 29. And the house had been, ha has become like one of the icons of this um, famous um, architecture partnership that lasted until uh, Shanaita's death in 39. Uh, I made the film in a uh, uh, residency at Zamek Ryazdowski in Warsaw. Um, that was, and it was shot in 2012. And again, some scenes were shot in, in 2013. So I talked about Saska Kempa. Um, the interesting thing about Saska Kempa is that um, it is, uh, it was just wetlands before, like let's say in, before 27, and um, it just um, started being developed from, from that time on. Um, what you can see um, circled in the center, that is um, the Lachet Scharneitze house. In the background, you see the Vistula, and the Vistula separates um, the um, uh, Saska Kempa, which is part of the Kraga district, from the old town of Warsaw. Um, the house um, was uh, partitioned um, in, in three parts. And um, maybe you recognize that it looks very much um, like the Le Corbusier contribution um, to the Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart. And um, indeed, Josef Schneitzer had been visiting the Weissenhof Siedlung in 27 and probably got inspired. Um, the um, segmentation of the house um, was um, useful in the sense that both architects, there were like um, Lachert was born in 1900, uh, Schneitzer was born in nine, uh, 1902. They were still at the very beginning of their career. And um, Budan Lachert's father, Václav, 
he had um, sponsored the construction of the house um, as a um, kind of a business card for the young architects to further their career. And the idea was that the Lachert family would live in one segment of the building, the left one, where I actually shot the film, and the other two segments were to be sold to refinance the building. Um, the building had been published multiple times over the years, and one of the first uh, publications was in Presence in 1930. And you can see this um, uh, quite artistic collage, including the portraits of the architects. Presence was um, uh, an avant-garde group uh, founded in 1926 that um, included uh, Lachert and Chanaitza, as well as um, Shimon Circus and Helena Circus, um, I will talk about later, um, and other architects and artists of the Warsaw art scene. The predecessor of Presence was actually Block, um, another magazine and a group that was more focused on uh, constructivism and art and less on architecture. So these um, images are from all from, they're all clippings from magazines and papers. So you can see how clean the photographs were and how like uh, in the center of the living room, we had this chimney that looked very, um, in the style of, of modernism, very, very strict. And um, here again, you have the chimney on the left, um, but also um, you can see the large window pane um, that was um, um, influenced, like the building was influenced by Le Corbusier, as I said, and it was actually following the five points of uh, modern housing by Le Corbusier, um, which um, um, made that the weight of the building was put on pillars instead of uh, walls. So um, the walls didn't have to carry um, the whole building and um, it was possible to have large window, uh, window panes um, and um, a, a free floor plan. Um, in the 80s, um, this is from a supplement to a Warsaw newspaper. In the 80s, after Abuda Lachert himself had uh, already spent many years in the house, you can see how he himself had altered it. You can see the chimney and the, and the lower left. And then here again, <clears throat> in this photo also on the left. And um, he had decorated the chimney that was um, very clean before with uh, ceramics and souvenirs that he had brought back from his journeys. These are images that I took in 2012 that showed the, um, the interior um, in, in the state it was at the time. And you will recognize the um, images that are in the film. I mean, they, they look this similar. So the chimney from one side it got mantled and from the other side you had to still some leftovers of the ceramics. And um, the window um, with the flowers was like already installed by Bodan Lachert. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, it was a very creative collaboration and um, the war put an end to this collaboration. And um, sadly, Josef Schanetza uh, died very early. Um, in, like, in, in the very beginning when he was working as a driver for the military. Um, and um, Budan Lachert, he also, um, as, a, as an homage to his partner, he had created a portrait bust of, um, of his partner that was to sit in his um, living room. So I spoke what in the constellation 
is me. And now I will um, talk a little about what would be the neighbors. In the film, um, there are some of the actors are named um, according to the houses they represent. So in the film, you would have the Lalevich house, the, the Circus house, and the Shanaitza house. Those are the names of the architects. They are all, um, as it says in the title, um, in the neighborhood of, um, of the Lachat Shanaitza house, which is the longish building at the very center um, of, of the contemporary photo, aerial photo of uh, Saska Kempa. Across from the street on, um, on Katowice 10 um, is um, the, the house by Lalevich. And then if you go further up north, uh, you have the house um, by uh, Helena and Shivon Circus, which is Katowice 26. And then again, another character in the film um, is um, the house on, on Cheska. Uh, it is Cheska 14 to Cheska 20. And again, it is a segmented house. Um, it was constructed by four different architects, um, one of which was uh, Josef Schanetza. Um, and um, so th uh, those four houses were characters in the film. This is um, the house I mentioned just across from, um, from the Buran Lachert and the Josef Schanetza house. Um, it was by um, con constructed, um, as I said, by Marianne Lalevich. And um, he is um, of an older generation. When um, uh, Lachert and Janetza, who met during the studies at the Warsaw Technical University, um, when they were still students, he was already a professor there. Um, he came from like what is now Lithuania, uh, Lithuania but then um, studied at first in, in, in Russia and he taught already in, um, in St. Petersburg before coming to Warsaw. So um, he, uh, and after um, he came to Warsaw, he uh, started reconstructing, renovating mostly official like uh, buildings or governmental buildings um, in a kind of um, historic style. And he is known for this kind of academic uh, classicism. But in this case, it's a villa. So, the Villa Cross, and you can see it in the film. This, um, this villa is not uh, seen in the film, only the person who represents it. And it's the house by, uh, constructed by Helena and uh, Shimon Circus. Um, they both were of the same generation as, um, as Lachard and Chanaitza. And um, they were very internationally connected um, they were friends with um, Gropius, with Le Corbusier, and also with Picasso. And Elena um, Schirkus, she was the secretary of the CIAM, of the Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne. So um, that, that was part of the reason why she, she knew um, Gropius and Le Corbusier. And, um, also, she was the, the Polish link um, to, to this international um, group of, of modern architecture. Um, and Kresens could be seen as the Polish outpost of um, this kind of movement. The house was constructed for um, carpet manufacturer um, and his um, Swedish um, actress wife. Um, this is also uh, exemplary for the, for the inhabitants of Saska Kempa. They were mostly architects, um, many of them inhabiting their own buildings, writers, 
there was a very famous um, scenographist, um, singers and uh, actors. So it was uh, a very creative avant-garde community in pre-World War II. Um, this is the house uh, Josef Schanetzer lived in before his dad, death. Um, as I said, it was segmented. You can you can see the, the segmentation and the photograph. And um, um, Janaitza inhabited the part that was second from the left. Uh, it was number 18. Um, to illustrate the neighborhood, um, I, I present some more of the buildings in Saska Kempa to give you an idea of um, the architectural um, icons um, that were among the neighbors. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the very beginning, I wanted to um, try out the systemic constellation, um, something that I'd never um, used before to explore um, the architecture. And uh, systemic constellation is um, um, an alternative therapy used to um, like unlock traumas in, in families and uh, um, to, to heal traumas and conflicts. Um, one of its founders, or supposedly founders, was Bert Hellinger. And um, he had developed this method in, in the 90s. So um, what happens is um, a group of people gathers. They don't need to know each other. In our case, they didn't know each other before. And um, they are guided by a kind of um, therapist. One uh, member of the group will present their problem or their conflict. They would be called seekers. And um, the, um, the person will look for representatives among the group of participants. So one person will represent the seeker and other persons will represent um, the people involved in the conflict. And um, the acting out of the conflict happens in the way that they are always asked about how they feel with each other and what position will help them to feel better. And um, little by little, um, they find out what, um, what position is good for them. And on the way, the journey um, reveals like information that was like unknown before and um, that will help to, to heal the conflict. <clears throat> and um, the, as I, the example I was giving uh, speaks about people representing other people, but it can be done um, also with objects representing people. But in our case, we tried out something new. We used people to represent objects, to um, represent houses, and that is, in the end, to animate those houses. Um, as I was saying, the, the spatial placement is very important, and I um, was um, referring to that in, in the undertitles of the film. So each person is attributed um, horizontal level uh, for their um, speeches, for their, for their, yeah. So I'm not is um, spoken by this uh, person on the left. And everything throughout the whole film, he says, would be on, on this same horizontal level. And it's also reflected in, in the titles, this um, kind of, placement. So um, the last thing I will present is uh, images of a, of a publication I made. Um, it is in Rizu Print and it um, shows images of the um, 
of the film and uh, it has a special photographic edition. And uh, the edition shows, it's like during the warm up of the film, it shows um, uh, kind of a pedestal coming out of the wall. And that was actually the pedestal, the bust of Josef Schneidza uh, was sitting um, in the living room of uh, Rudan Lachert. So um, thank you for listening. And um, yes, um, I will hand over to Kate. Verena. Hello, hello. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you, Susanna, and thank, thank you, Susan, for your extremely interesting presentations. And uh, I will present now. Can you see the, the full screen? Yes. Okay. So um, the film that you uh, that you might have uh, been watching and the publication is part of a research project, but it's not a research project that we plan, but a kind of research topic that we, I don't know how to say, it's not something that we really planned. We, we went step by step and it somehow became our focus and interest. And so different um, events and a publication and a film came out of it and it's still going on. So the first image is an image from a student work at Bauhaus Universität Weimar when we prepared during a seminar for a field trip to Japan. And I did this seminar together with Niklas Faneser, who also became part of the team of the film in the end. Um, and when we thought about how to prepare for this field trip, we thought about six different chapters and one of the chapter was Bauhaus and Japan. And the chapter was to be filled by ourselves. So it's not that we knew everything about Bauhaus and Japan, we didn't know anything about it. It was more or less a title for something to, to be developed. We knew some things. We had read some um, writings and we knew about um, some stories. And this is an exhibition we had just before traveling to Japan with the 16 students and two of the students had um, uh, had been working within the chapter Bauhaus in Japan that you can see in the left upper corner. And, and they called their research stories from Dessau and Tokyo. And they focused on a young couple, Iwao and Michiko Yamawaki, who moved from Tokyo to Dessau to join the, the Bauhaus school in Dessau for two years. And... Um, she went to different classes and he was an architect who was an architect before. He was also interested in theater and uh, uh, I think scenography and he, he worked with theater and interior designs. And when he came to the Bauhaus, he joined the master class of Walter Peter Hans who, who uh, held a class about photography on photography. So he became a photographer during his time in, uh, in uh, Dessau. And when they came back, he built this, he built this house for a, for a friend, for an artist who was around 30, like Iwao Yamawaki himself. And the artist Kutaro Migishi died before the house was finished. And then his wife, Setsuko Migishi, who was also a painter, lived there with her family, then later moved to Europe and then came back to resettled in Japan. And they transformed the house and then they built an apartment house in the back of the house and the house itself became a storage. And I'm presenting you a few photographs that 
most probably Iwao Yamawaki took himself, but they are uh, scans from postcards that the, the owner of the house gave to us. And you can see, clearly see the influence of the Baos. It almost looks like a European, maybe Mediterranean modernist house. You could maybe also find it in Los Angeles. It's interesting if you look at the plants and the water bassin in the next to the entrance. And then this is the studio space for the artist, the main space of the house and a very simple but beautiful steel staircase. And here you have the, the studio space on a wider, uh, in, a, in a wider perspective. And the, the large window is um, opens to the south, interestingly. And um, yeah, so these are photographs from, uh, from the time when the house was finished and Sitsuko uh, Megishi uh, lived there. So one of our goals was to, fit, to find the house in Tokyo. And this is Nakano, it's a suburb of Tokyo. And it looks like the, the largest part of Tokyo looks like because Tokyo is a kind of fabric of one family houses that every 30 years are taken down and renewed and the plots are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the, the former large plot of the Migishi Atelier has become, is still large, but there's this apartment house, but you can rarely, almost not see it. And then we get closer and then you can see the staircase and the lamp and you have the feeling that there must be something behind the wall. So these are already stills from our film, which is a kind of documentary. I will talk about it later. And so we went for the first time to Tokyo with the students. We came back. We tried to evaluate our trip, what we had seen. We went to many different places in Japan. And then a smaller group, um, a smaller group decided to do more research on the two houses, Migishi Atelier and Bonsu Yamaguchi House. I will present the next one later uh, because we were, we became really interested in the houses for, I think, many reasons. So one reason was that especially the Megishi Atelier had many cracks and was in a very bad um, condition. So it was not clear if the house would survive. It was, nobody lived there, but it was maintained by the owner who had saved it from being a storage. But it, it was not really clear what the future of the house would be. And we thought we should go back to Japan and document this house and the other one, and maybe to work on an article for a magazine and maybe do some fundraising to repair the houses and to raise in the, uh, the, the, the knowledge about these houses. And uh, when we came back the second time to Japan, we uh, asked a befriended artist to join us. And we already had the idea not to take photographs and to make drawings, but rather to work with film because we thought that the house Houses are one side of it, and the owners, which we had met during our first trip, were really interesting and very generous people and interested in constructing their own stories about the Bauhaus heritage, the, the, the Bauhaus they had inherited with these houses. So our interest, in a way, shifted a bit from documenting the architecture to being part of the community building of the people who, who, who currently live in the houses. Here's uh, two pages from the little book that we then worked on, because when we worked on the film and we worked on editing the film, we decided to take out the interviews we had done with architects and academics in Japan and to move them to a different format to keep to to leave the film as pure and um, authentic by 
what the people say who live in the houses. So it's only fo photo photography and how the people um, share the houses with their communities. And the interviews we did are in the little book and also um, some images from the film and the English subtitles because the film is in Japanese. So here's uh, uh, Aiko Yamamoto who says until five years ago or so we had been using it as a storage space, something that I already told you. And this is Aiko Yamamoto. We are still in contact with her. I wrote to her about this event today and she, she was really interested and uh, she maintains the house in a, in a very strange and interesting way. So it's empty, nobody lives there. There's a uh, stove, as you can see, we went there in January for the second time. She places some objects from her family, but then she rents it for photo shoots, or she invites her neighbors and friends and a kind of community from Nakano who's interested in um, modernist architecture. So she uses this, the house for communication and for widening and largening her own community and to share the house with others. And this is one of the meetings she has. And this was during our shooting. So here and also the other house, we took part in a kind of event that became part of the film as much as the images from the houses. And here's some details. You can see that uh, there are a lot of Japanese elements in the house and it's in a way a very strange mix between European influences and Japanese elements like the wooden window to the right and this is in the uh, in, it's another staircase here and then there are some beautiful details like this lamp it's seen from the exterior and it's above the uh, main door, uh, the main entrance to the studio. And this is how it looks from the other side. So there's a hole in the wall. But here you can also see the many cracks from earthquakes and uh, the bad condition of the house. And then when we worked on the little book with the interviews, we decided to do some drawings, and this is especially Momo Kuyazaka and Maximilian von Zipplin, two team members who are now working in Switzerland, but at that time were just graduates from Bauhaus Universität Weimar. And you can see here, let me see. Um, yeah, you can see a section from 19, uh, 2019 and also a section from 1934 when the house was built. And you see how, uh, uh, how the house has been transformed, the roof has been changed and there are many other changes. Um, wait. Yeah, and here you can see the floor plan. To the, to the left is the, the ground floor plan and the upper floor plan from 1934. This matches with the photographs we have seen in the beginning. And to the right, you can see the ground floor plan and upper floor plan as it is today and how the entrance has moved and uh, some additions have been made. And the transformation of the houses was also something uh, very interesting for us because homes in Japan are not really listed because um, temples would be listed or public buildings, but private homes are not the objectives for preservation. And we became really interested how life has changed the houses or as uh, Susan, you have quoted, um, you said the floor plan is the plot. And this is exactly what we can see here. Uh, the floor plan has been changed because the plot has changed during the many years of um, using the house. And then this is an image from the film that I like a lot because it shows how fragile the house is and the 
stairs, the, the steel staircase. And now we are moving <laughs> to another place. Um, this is the offices um, that Bunzo Yamaguchi, the other architect, had uh, founded. It's a kind of cooperative. It still exists. And Bunzo Yamaguchi passed away, of course. But um, both architects were born around 1900, just before and just after. And uh, this is in an office district in Tokyo. And when we visited uh, this, these offices, they opened their archives. And on the tables, you can see drawings and photographs and um, original drawings and also passports and everything you can imagine from the private life, but also from the work life of Bunzu Yamaguchi. And we then visited the private home he had built for his family, and we became equally fascinated by this house. It's very different, but it also merges Japanese uh, influences and European influences. And it becomes more clear with this image. Again, these are stills from the film. And you can see how the main facade goes around the corner and it becomes clear that this is a wooden structure, a wooden house, just almost like a farmhouse, a rural house. Um, and later there was a garden and the, the son of the architect, Katsutoshi Yamaguchi, says in the film this was a garden for viewing, but later when he became older, a, a child, but a little bit older and wanted to meet friends, they added the swimming pool, it's empty now. And Katsutoshi Yamaguchi says in the film, the changes in society were so rapid that this place was more like an experimental space. The act of setting this house as an experimental case study reflects Bunzo Yamaguchi's character, an equivalent of testing the soul. I think, says his son, these uh, struggles and negotiations are all connected. Um, and this is him uh, preparing for a concert in the main space of the house. He lives in, on the upper floor with his wife. And here you can see the cladding that Bunzo Yamaguchi has um, proposed to his own house in the 1970s because he thought that it was not modern enough. So he modernized his own house from the 1940s. And again, Katsutoshi Yamaguchi and the audience. So the curtain in the back is the curtain next to the entrance and it became the, the curtain for the stage. This is uh, a beautiful detail that can be seen in the, in the film. And what we liked a lot is that in a small kitchen, women from the neighborhood would prepare the meals for uh, the, uh, the dinner after the concert. Yeah. And here again, drawings uh, to the left, 1940, and uh, the section, and to the right, also 1940, the floor plan. And um, there's a building in the, in the back of the garden. And you can see the former Japanese garden with the, the stones. And then later the swimming pool was added and the back building was transformed into an office building. One of our interview partners, Taishi Watanabe, says maybe this is the first architecture office in Japan because he thought that uh, Bunzo Yamaguchi, who had worked with Gropius, Walter Gropius, had brought the concept of the architecture office, of the architectural practice studio, uh, back to Japan. Um, so left is 1960 and to the right, nine, uh, 2019. <laughs> and here are some details, the curtain, the cladding. The cladding is made from we thought maybe acoustic panels. So it's a modular cladding that uh, hides the wooden structure. And then 
um, an image from a photo shoot because they showed us their photo books and this is a photo shoot that had been taken in the swimming pool. And this is a detail which we also found really interesting that in both houses, there are a lot of photo, or some photo shoots that are made there. So the houses have become like stages for the idea of modern life, even though the houses themselves are not in uh, um, yes no life in them anymore. So the houses have given up their, their original purpose on one hand, but they are used as backgrounds or stages because of their beauty as modernist houses. And then we had four interviews and one of them was with Helena Czapkova in Berlin in March uh, 2019. She's the one She's from Prague, she's living in Japan, and she is an art historian who works on the, who especially focuses on the interwar period between World War I and II and the relationship between Europe and Japan in arts and architecture. And there's one um, sentence I would like to read to you. She says, we are talking about our approach to document the houses, and she says, the stills, so the film stills produce a series of emotions about architecture, but also present a bigger issue about these houses as homes. We witness the decay, we feel the energy of the inhabitants, and we empathize with the ways people change the houses they live in. At the same time, the viewer can sense the potency of the modernist design of the two houses. And uh, yeah, and the last images are about an exhibition that we had in the Megishi Atelier when we came for the third time. This was when the film was ready, uh, finished, and we were invited by the Goethe Institute to present the film in Japan. And we exhibited stills from the film in the Megishi Atelier. So here you can see the facade of the Bunzo Yamaguchi house in the studio space of the Megishi Atelier. So the two houses are connected here. And this is the tatami room uh, on the upper level, level of the Megishi Atelier, where the steel staircase um, is connected to. Um, yes. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those were all super interesting. And um, I'm sure we have more questions than we have time, but I'll start out with a few for each of you. And um, I'm tempted to go backwards. So I think I'll start with Verena. Um, in your, you answered a lot of my questions in what you've just presented to us. Um, one of which was, how did you choose film and a book? Like, how did you choose those modes for, your pro the, for the product of your research? Um, and I guess you said that the research is continuing. Will it continue in these forms? How, what's the shape of it now? <laughs> it's interesting. So we are, it's continuing in a way like the meeting tonight. For me, it's tonight. So <laughs> the meeting tonight is in a way a kind of continuation of the project because when we started it we were focused on something we had seen and and felt and we really wanted to go deeper into it but we also wanted a little bit like Esther McCoy we wanted to document something that might be gone tomorrow this was our original approach but then it became a project that developed its own rules for example I was always interested in film but this is my first film. So uh, while shooting and later editing the film, it the project developed its own rules, such like we cannot include the interviews, we have to do a book. Yeah. To have the interviews, but not in the, <laughs> in the film. We don't want to comment the film. We want to, uh, to have it like it is. And, um, and then every 
screening and every presentation. And there were some until now, which we, we didn't plan anything. It just happened. So for example, we, it was super interesting to bring the project back to Japan, of course. And we presented it in the R Plus Salon in Berlin, which was a presentation to the architecture community in Berlin. R Plus is a, is a magazine. Then we applied for the future architecture platform with the idea behind the project. And we were accepted in this spring. And the Mies van der Rohe Foundation in Barcelona uh, invited us to present the film in the uh, Barcelona pavilion, which, is, which was absolutely extreme because it was during kind of lockdown. So the Barcelona pavilion, which is rebuilt, as we know, it's not the original one, was presented to us like a TV studio. So we had the feeling that we are presenting our work, but they are presenting a kind of television studio to us, you know, like, uh, again, it was like a theater space, uh, as if modernist architecture were, you know, presented to us in a very strange way. And uh, so we became part, we, I, I have the feeling that we, while do, doing this work or through doing this work, we became part of a larger environment. Mm -hmm. Today, it's more, it's rather art and architecture, but in Barcelona, it was <laughs> really interesting because they are working on the heritage of, uh, of the, starting from the Barcelona pavilion, but they are also very much interested in houses and homes because they think that houses are under acknowledged, no, underestimated, and that we really should look at um, architecture as it is presented in homes because, and again, Esther McCoy uh, has worked on this because homes are so much connected with life and what else should architecture be, even though it's a small scale, what, what should a, you know, a library or a museum, it's a container for something else, but homes are what, it, what they are, as the houses uh, Susanna has presented. So it's, uh, it has become really interesting. And I don't know, I, I think Maximilian and Momoko, Momoko is Japanese, without her, the project would not have been possible because all the dialogues are in Japanese and she had to, to communicate. <laughs> so we, every evening we would prepare what we wanted to do and then she had to, to present it during our stays in Tokyo because the owners of course don't speak English. So there was no way of talking in English to them. So that, that's maybe what I said. Maybe they want to do a PhD one day because they always say after having worked in architecture offices in Basel and Zurich, they really want to go back to academics. This could be one way, but there can be many others. I don't know. It's just as if it's not finished yet. Right. Yeah. Very generative. Um, I also want to invite the other panelists if you guys have a question. Feel free to chime in. Um, and uh, oh, let's see. So one of the participants in the meeting at the Megishi Atelier, um, and it seemed like she was speaking from a personal point of view rather than a professional one, said, if we don't document this, it will disappear. Writing is not enough. I'm rediscovering the importance of historical objects. I'm wondering about what are your thoughts on this comment? Yeah, that was, she's not a professional, you're absolutely right. And we were not sure if this was something she, she was not old, old, but she was not young. So it's something that she had discovered. She's, she's very honest with what she's saying. She, she has discovered that history is something that belongs to us or that helps us to understand our own lives and that writing can be a good thing to, to, um, to write things down, but that a physical space and another person says, this is about space. I don't know if you remember, this is also one of the a male 
participant in the discussion. This is about, he says it doesn't look nice, but it's, it's about space. And maybe this is something that also connects with her, uh, you know, with what she says, that she says writing is not enough. We, we have to go deeper into it and we have to, of course, this could be a, a very conserv conservative approach to preservation that we cannot keep everything, right? It's not possible to keep everything. But um, nobody in this group said that the transformation of the house had done something bad to the house. I think most of the people thought that the house has been transformed, but it's still there. It tells us its story, the, the life of the people who lived in there. Um, an architectural historian whom we also interviewed, and also an architect, Hironobu Fujimori, he has written about the house and he said, you know, we don't care that much about the Bunsu Yamaguchi house, but the Megishi Atelier is something we want to keep. And when we asked him, what do you think is important about the house? And he said, important is the window and the staircase. Mm -hmm. So he, he doesn't think that the house as a whole is important, but the window and the staircase is mm -hmm. important. And then later on, he says, we Japanese, we, we don't believe in preserving architecture like in Europe. We believe in mountains, landscapes, and you know, other, other things or objects or phenomena that we want to remember, that we, where we want to come back to and so on. He says it's very interesting that in Europe people want to, to come back to a certain building because this would remind them of their use or something they have, you know, experienced 50 years ago and so on. So, uh, yeah, I think she is, it's a, it's a private perspective that she has. It's, she discovered that there is something that is different to books or writings or, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so mm -hmm. interesting. Um, I have more questions, but I will um, move to Susanna now. Um, and Susanna, you touched on this in your presentation, um, but after, after your film opens, it primarily documents something that we can't see. It's the atmosphere between the buildings or the psychological space. And you could consider this the most interior space of the buildings or of the neighborhood. I'm just curious how you chose this to be your object of study or like, why did you choose to render this? Um, yeah, first um, I chose the method that was a systemic consolation. And for me, it was about um, learning um, history with your body, uh, as opposed to uh, reading in a, in a book about it. And um, we did different sessions, but this one is, um, um, it's also the first session that um, the relationship with the neighbors. So it's also imagining the houses almost as um, living beings. And um, uh, yeah, I was talking about animation before that um, they would become animated in, in that sense. And um, the participants of the sessions would identify with the houses. And then um, there were, it was interesting because the participants, um, not all of them knew all the houses, even though they were just in the neighborhoods. And um, their backgrounds were really like various. Some of them would come with a therapist because the therapist was a professional therapist. Um, she would do this um, in, her, um, in her workspace and um, yeah, she was and um, so some would come with her, some would uh, come through the connection with the place where I did the residency and uh, they didn't know each other and some of them were a bit um, scared also of the procedure. And uh, um, yeah, and in the end also the, the camera team, they, um, they moved you for a second. 
hooked up and, and we're talking to everybody and then we are, uh, sorry? We are, um, we are part of the session, so. Uh, and um, so I was curious about the method and I was also as a first, uh, first step uh, curious about how it would be if the, um, if the houses were people. And um, I had asked the therapist before whether uh, she had done sessions where people were presenting objects and she had said she had done one where a person was a ring. And um, that was um, the only experience. And uh, um, what was um, interesting was that, for instance, that the house that felt kind of lonely and not included in the, uh, like with the rest of them, it's also the house that is the furthest away physically in, in the neighborhood or um, the neighboring house would be dominated by, by the Lachet and Janetta house. So these were things that just came up and part of them, yeah, what is interesting is that you can think of uh, kind of a way of searching the truth. And there was one of them who was uh, a great architect and who was working in the house, in the Lachet Janetta house so, and he, he knew the whole story. So um, in a way he could, could confirm what uh, came out in the session, but that was not the ob uh, objective of the, of the session. The session, it was more like, um, um, yeah, uh, learning with your bodies and the communication is, um, uh, is through feelings, like uh, all the participants express their feelings. And this could be, uh in it could be seen in contrast or in as a as an echo to the architecture like this um i found this interesting to challenge the the built bodies with this communication through feelings so. mm -hmm. well, that's really interesting um how did with that in mind how did you approach editing what was I mean, I know mm. you, you like. Yeah, the editing um, would then. Oh, sorry, I didn't get your last um, question. Oh, yeah, no, I was just asking um, how you approach editing with that in mind, oh. your objective there. Yes. Um, the editing was. Uh, in the end, it became like a, a fictional story. And that was um, uh, kind of to be seen like parallel with the building or um, there could be uh, meeting points. And then the editing, um, a lot that was edited out, there was a lot of time where nothing would happen, where they would just stand in the, in the space and um, yeah, it was like interesting for me that it would happen in the building. So the influence of the um, have an impact. And so um, the editing, yeah, lots of the material went out and um, kind of filling words like, um, how do you feel or something that was repeated many times. So that was edited out to um, in the end, it was all like to, um, yeah, uh, a story was created through the process. Yeah. Um, excellent. And now I will hop over to Susan Morgan. Um, uh, so Esther McCoy made this film to presumably to get the word out about the building. And um, as part of her effort to save the house, and you in turn saved the film. Um, and because of your efforts, we now have a chance to see it, you know, it's on YouTube. And you have put the film back into circulation. Um, and it's not, this isn't the only time you've put McCoy's work back into circulation. I mean, you've edited a book of her writing. And I'd just be interested, I think it'd be interesting to hear about your work with McCoy, if you don't mind. 
Um, well, I've written about to, you know, that I moved to Los Angeles from New York and that Esther McCoy's work was recommended to me. And you and I have talked about this, that initially I thought it was going to be theoretical um, and, you know, that I would read it and that would be it. But instead, um, you know, she's such a wonderful writer um, that I just kept reading, you know, looking for more and more um, of her work. And she's an incredibly attentive writer. And also it's difficult to write about visual work, um, but it's even more difficult to write about space. And she's able to write about space. And uh, I mean, this is a little sidebar to what I'm finding interesting in the conversation is uh, how the houses in Japan have now become a backdrop like a theatrical backdrop. And I really feel that your project um, is, is activating the space and animating the space. And also that Susanna's project really does that of, of really understanding um, uh, what, how space operates, how people in space, um, you know, interact and function. Uh, so back to the Esther McCoy question was that uh, what I found um, was that although all the people that Esther McCoy had written about, uh, there were a lot of books about them, there wasn't anything about Esther McCoy. And so she had carried this message and then kind of been forgotten. And you know, the architectural historian, Catherine Smith, who was a friend of Esther McCoy's, um, a young friend of Esther McCoy's, uh, said that she thought it was that image culture had eclipsed the written word and that people remembered the photographs um, and didn't remember who had written the story. Right. So I think there was that aspect um, to why she hadn't been uh, written about. When I worked on the anthology, uh, she had been approached uh, to write an anth to come put together an anthology herself, and that never happened. And so, I used some of that in my selection. But since my selection was uh, focused entirely on Los Angeles, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done because she wrote uh, extensively about um, Italy and about Mexico. Um, you know, South America. I mean, so there's a lot more to, you know, so people can do more anthologies. Uh, I think getting more of the work out uh, is really important. So I don't know what else to do. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then um, McCoy makes an argument at the end of her film that you quote um, about how we need to save the immediate past. So the future uh, so there's a distant past for the future. And we don't have the Dodge House now, but we have this film. Um, do you think McCoy saw a document and this document specifically is the next best thing? Um, I don't know. I think she really, I, from her correspondence, um, she was very hopeful about the film and and very um, persistent in trying to find support for it. And one of the, for Saving the Dodge House, and you know, I made a little note to myself, one of the things um, in 1969, there was a plan, bef uh, well, it's previous to 1969 because he died in 1969, but the financier Bart Litton had uh, the property and his plan and it was to keep the Dodge House and, uh, you know, it was on a large, on a large lot um, and build condominiums around it. So it would be uh, sort of an architectural uh, souvenir. You know, it wouldn't be a house any longer that uh, functioned as a house, uh, but it would be the clubhouse or something for the condominium community. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then he died and then another bank uh, took over you know, the ownership and then they demolished it without any notice. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a student group that was on their way to visit the house um, that afternoon. And as Robert Winter, you know, I actually quoted Robert Winter said to me uh, uh, that Esther McCoy said, if only they had told them that they were going, told Robert Winter or Esther McCoy that the house was going to be torn down, they could have gone in and taken, you know, some of the mahogany banisters or the tiles or something, you know, to have, you know, absolutely everything was destroyed. Right. And um, one last question before I turn to Q&A. Where did she screen the film and who saw it? Do you have any sense of that? Um, it was screened um, at the LA County Museum. Uh, I know that it was shown several times. She tried to get it into the collection of UCLA. Uh, they weren't interested um, in it. Uh, one of the things that um, when we did the exhibition, we did it, an exhibition about Esther McCoy uh, at the Schindler House. And in one room, uh, we dedicated it to uh, the Dodge House and the campaign to save the Dodge House. And one of the letters, um, one of her fundraising letters, responses to her fundraising letters was from someone, I think, I can't remember the exact amount. I think she got $300 from her. And then there was a handwritten note um, that said, uh, uh, could you send me, uh, I'm, I realize I'm making this check out, you know, um, it's tax deductible, right? And a friend of mine who has, you know, doesn't really know about the architectural world at all, said to me, who is this person? She's, you know, that's really some wealthy person. And it was um, Phyllis Lambert mm -hmm. from the Canadian Center for Architecture. And so she gave this small amount of money, but wanted to make sure she got her tax break. So didn't really have um, a great philanthropic interest in preserving, you know, helping preserve the house. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I, I think you also asked um, that the, the film, and I don't know whether this comes out, you know, I think uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't screened for years, it wasn't seen. Uh, and the, there was a reverse negative print uh, uh, at the Motion Picture Academy because the director uh, was uh, Robert Snyder and uh, he had an Academy Award, so they collected the films. Uh, so the only actual reel was what I found at the um, Archives of American Art was Esther McCoy's copy. Mm -hmm. oh, wow that we were able to get preserved. Um, okay. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A. This is from Sharon, uh, Shannon Forrest. Thank, thank you to you all for these fascinating presentations. I have a question for all of you, though perhaps principally Verena von Beckerath and Susanna Berner. Both of you visually an analogize the house to the body. In Berner's case, this happens in the course of the speculative embodied simulation of spatial relations in the systemic constellation. In von Beckeroth's case, this happens by observing the labor of maintaining the house, houses that resembles caring for a decaying body, scenes of sweeping, crumbling paint, etc. What does this anthology between the body and the house make possible for you? If it suggests a kind of autonomy to the house, as McCoy suggests of the boulder-like Dodge house, what does this autonomy mean for us? Um, so should I start or? Um... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what does this um, mean for us? Um, Um, oops. Susanna, our connection isn't great, so we can't hear you for some reason. It's um, 
There you are. Uh, yeah, far it's and if you see it really abstract, it's it to a similar level. It doesn't like the. Oh, uh, okay. Is it no better? Now we can hear. Is it you. okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess you could say that um, it uh, like um, the analogy between uh, built bodies and human bodies um, that is drawn in the film kind of flattens the differences and um, um, and it also invites to um, to look at the buildings from like yeah from a from a new perspective from a different perspective and um, uh, it is um, it includes um, the physical presence of the buildings, but also the story of the buildings. Um, uh, yeah, and I guess with the physical presence, you could also say that the space they inhabit, not just the um, just I think we're missing the end of what you're saying. I don't know if other people can hear. Hmm. Let's see. Susanna, I'm sorry, I think you're frozen. Limited to the to the actual building. Um each house is an organized um, uh, and the, um each house is like an I I can frozen. Yes. Um, um hmm, I don't know what to... now we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, I'll try again. Um yeah, I was gonna say it's not just about um um like this flattening of the difference between built body and human body includes um uh, different levels. It includes the um, the history. Um, then it includes also the the physical presence and the organization of space. And in in that moment, it's not only the organization, not only the organization of space of one building, but um, uh, of the whole settlement. So um, it invites um, to look at all this from from. Uh, yeah, from, from a different perspective to, to see it as a living thing, as opposed to like um, stone equals to uh, like uh, a dead object or something. So yes, it is, uh, it is this, that it's um, what it means to me. And to me, it's also like something open. Um, as the constellation is open, we started it like in the beginning, I, I didn't even know, I had never used this process before in my life. So the first time I went to, to such a session was with this, um, with Margot Jato uh, Lico, the therapist. And um, so the, the project was open, but also uh, to me, the kind of learning about the buildings was open. And I think in general, the, the perspective I, I propose is this kind of open perspective that is not um, something that is fixed in the building. Yeah. Thank you. Lorena, do you have anything to add to this idea? I, I have the feeling that I maybe didn't get the question from the audience right. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to <laughs> to uh, to discuss the um, the idea of autonomy, but I didn't really get the what the question was in relation to autonomy. Can you repeat it, please? I can repeat it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I please, can... please. <laughs> read the whole thing. Um, well, okay. I have a question for all of you. Um, this is specifically to Susanna and Verena. Both of you visually analogize the house to the body. In Berner's case, this happens in the course of the speculative embodied simulation of spatial relations in the systemic constellation. Mm -hmm. In von Becker's case, this happens by observing the labor of maintaining the houses. Mm -hmm. 
that resembles carrying forth a decaying body, scenes of sweeping, crumbling paint, etc. What does this analogy between the body and the house make possible for you? Okay. <laughs> maybe the autonomy is almost a separate. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Okay. No, I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I thought autonomy was important, but I think it's, it's something else. That's very interesting. It's a very interesting question because it's true that we were extremely interested in the maintenance of the buildings. And of course, the maintenance is done through the bodies of uh, people and the houses also become bodies, not like in Susanna's uh, film, but they have... They are, they look at us, yeah? That's why I have chosen the, the photos from the, you know, the, the ones that Iwao Yamawaki took. They look at us, they invite us to, to think about them, to, we <laughs> you really want to know more about them. Why is this house in Japan? Why is it not published? Why is it not part of architecture history? You know, why, what is it? What is the reason? And, um, so um, in our case, transformation is also really important. So you have the research for why are these houses there? How have they been thought and realized? Then there is this idea of transformation that you have to grasp before you can really, it's, it's not so easy to understand what transformation does because it also goes to the future we don't really know it's it's open because it's not finished you could say the house has a certain setting but as soon as the bodies and the people who live in take care of it or move in the house obviously changes and with these two houses the changes have been there have been very strong changes and the changes are really part of the houses because they were made to be changed. But our European <laughs> eyes look at them as objects and we, they taught us that they are not, yeah, that they are the houses and the stories of the houses and the people, Katsutoshi and Aiko, they taught us through the way they are living and working with and within the houses and sharing how they share the houses, which is also very important with other bodies, that the houses become less objects and rather more spaces in less defined spaces that are de defined by what, is, what people are doing in there. Maybe this could be a way to describe it. But it's complex. It's very complex, I think, because it's not only the object and the body, but there's this transformative um, idea. Yeah, also. <laughs> but maintenance is also really interesting. So, and taking care for houses, I think it's a really nice way of looking at modernist houses and houses we it's not really that we want to save them but we want to we want to give them a stage we want to give them we want that people know about them right um, and yeah I, I, for us film was a very good way to to, to work with this complexity of time and space and people and bodies and so on. No. Wonderful. Um, well, I promised you all that this would take only an hour and we're, all, we're approaching two hours. So I want to be respectful of your time. But um, I think Adam rightly wanted to make a plug for um, Susan's book. The, um, mm -hmm. This is an East of Thank you. publication. It's so wonderful. And uh, so. Um, yeah. I wanted to say um, one quick thing that, with, that's interesting, you know, about, you know, the house and the body. And, you know, since I've written about houses a lot and, you know, it comes back 
you know, to the Freudian in, in dreams and uh, that the house is identity. So there always is this, you know, aspect of it. But um, in more recent times here in Los Angeles, um, now that the Schindler House is approaching its 100th birthday, uh, it has what uh, is called concrete cancer. And that they actually call it that. Um, and, you know, the Sixth Street Bridge in Los Angeles was demolished because of the same reason that the concrete, the hundred year old concrete, whereas, um, you know, the terrible irony uh, of it is that the Dodge House um, had six inch reinforced concrete walls and probably would have survived um, much better than these other, than these other structures have. Um, you know, and as Cecilia Reef said, they had to beat it um, to bring it down. So that's another great loss and, and tragedy. Well, thank you so much to all of you. This has been really wonderful. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. It was uh, very inspirational. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I hope we can stay in contact. I, that would be great. Yeah. Interesting. That would be great. Do it.